What is going on, everyone? John Kelly here, FightNumbers.com. Here to break down the fights for UFC Rio Rancho. Coming off UFC 247, honestly, was not a great card for me, but that's okay. This is a nice bounce back spot here. Um, I think this is a really underrated card. And we'll get into some of the reasons I, I think why, but um, this is a free card, ESPN+. Plus. Um, if you don't already have it, definitely check that out. I think it's highly highly worth it but as per usual we're gonna break down the fights um go go fight by fight i'm gonna talk about how i see it playing out gonna talk DraftKings pricing some strategy and uh some some of the betting market values that i see right now that are out there um and if you have any questions feel free to interrupt me um try to keep it on the fight that we're talking about as per usual and basically at the end i'll recap um my core plays and tournament strategy all of this info along with the video replay of this can be found at fightnumbers.com in case you weren't able to join us live. I know it's a weeknight and not everyone can make it and that's okay. All right, first fight up on the card. As always, I'll be referencing best fight odds. Um, that is my go-to in uh, betting odds research. It just has you know 10 or 12 different books that they reference. So um, all of the lines that I'll be referring to is from Best Fight Odds, just so you're aware. First fight up on the cards, Mark De La Rosa versus Raulian Paiva. Paiva. Um, this one is definitely interesting. I thought we were going to get a little bit more value on Paiva. Paiva, the minus 235 favorite to come back on Mark De La Rosa is plus 195. Um, I was hoping that we would get a, some better value on Paiva, but it's actually moved um, pretty heavily in his favor um he's a 235 favorite um beginning of the week he was around 200 and you know the thing about paiva is he's actually really good despite being 0-2 in the ufc paiva is a team alpha male product he was on a 12 fight win streak he was previously brazil's number one flyweight prior to making his ufc debut and in his debut he dropped that split decision against kai car of france which i thought he won Kind of a robbery, um, in my opinion. If you don't think so, go back and watch the fight. Um, in his next fight, he faced uh, Rogerio Bontarin, who's actually fighting on this card as well. He's going to fight Ray Borg. We'll get to that fight later. Uh, but he landed a big shot early that actually caused the doctor to to stop the fight and examine Bontarin. And basically, his his um, it looked like his che cheekbone. I don't think it was his orbital. I'm pretty sure it was his cheekbone was really messed up. I mean, he had a a big old welt on his cheekbone. It was it was pretty gruesome. Um, but I guess the doctor said he was okay to continue. And he's lucky he did because later on that round, he actually caught Paeva with a nasty knee that opened up Paeva's eyebrow. So the doctor actually had to come back. This was the same round, the first round. Doctor had to come back and examine Paeva now to see if he could continue. And he decided that he couldn't. So after getting screwed on the Kai Kara France decision, then he gets a doctor stoppage loss in a fight that he was actually winning um, up to that point. So it's just been really unfortunate run in the UFC for Paeva. And I think this is definitely where he writes the ship against Mark De La Rosa, who's pretty much a one-dimensional grappler. Um, he is a black belt BJJ, likely going to try to take the fight there. But Paeva has like absurd takedown defense. Um, so really some of the best takedown defense I've seen at this, um, at this, in this division. Um, so take that for what it's worth. Um, you know, Mark De La Rosa struggled to take Kai Car France down. And if that's the case, then I think Paiva will be able to keep this on the feet and beat him up on the feet. So that's kind of how I see this, this fight playing out. I do think De La Rosa is a live dog. Um, cause he has a decent enough chin and, um, he trains out of a good camp. He's out of Factory X Muay Thai. Um, but like I said, I mean, he's pretty much just a one-dimensional grappler. I think Paeva is the real deal, despite the the bad luck, I'll say, um, up to this point in the UFC. So the official pick is Paeva by decision. Uh, like I said, I thought we'd get some better value out of the betting line, but it seems like everyone else is kind of on the same page, uh, despite Paeva's poor record. Um, but I'll still be adding it to parlays. Um, because I don't see De La Rosa really, um, really winning this one.
And then in terms of uh, DraftKings, we'll pull up DraftKings scoring because I actually forget what they have. Um, these guys priced that. De La Rosa, Paiva. Yeah, so Paiva is 8,800. Not a strong inside distance line for 8,800. Um, like I said, I am confident he wins, but his inside distance line is plus 423. And it's actually gotten worse since the Open. So 8.8K, um, there's just... Uh, better targets. I like the bet more than I like. I like to play on DraftKings. Not that he can't score well, but at that price, he sort of has to score well. So, um, yeah. I, I just realized I didn't pull up best fight odds. I have the image still showing. Sorry about that. For those of us joining us live, um, let's do this window capture. There we go. There's the odds. Oh, one too many. There's my beautiful face. All right. All right, we're back on track here. Um, yeah, so Peva by decision is the official pick. Uh, next fight up on the card is Macy Chason versus Shanna Young. Um, this one is all all uh, Macy Chason, Chason here. Um, she comes in as the favorite, obviously. The matchup was originally supposed to be against Nico Mont Montano, who I think she would have smoked as well. But uh, Shane Young stepped in to replace her after uh, Montana uh, withdrew from the fr from the fight. And right away, when when they announced uh, Shane Young as the replacement, I instantly remembered watching her fight on Dana White Contender Series last summer because I remember her losing to like this uh, chubby fighter that looked like she wasn't anywhere near. UFC level and that, that's Sarah Alpar. Um, she actually um, got subbed by her and did not look great at all. Um, she's an aggressive fighter, but I mean, really, really low level stuff here in terms of skill level. I think she's massively outmatched against uh, Macy Chasson. Chasson is a former um, Ultimate Fighter winner. She was undefeated in the UFC prior to her last fight against Lena Landsberg. Despite um, struggling to get her game plan going in that fight against Landsberg, I don't think that's going to be an issue here, and I still have confidence in her. Um, like I said, Shayna Young just shouldn't be at this level, honestly. Um, Jason's wrestling and grappling will be way too much for her, especially if Sarah Alpar's grappling was too much for her. And I even think... Um, Macy Chasson has the advantage in the striking department as well. I didn't see anything that would indicate that Shaney Young um, he really has any advantage in this fight. So the pick is Ch uh, Chasson here, and I think she gets back on track with an, an early finish in this one. I actually do think she gets a finish, so I, I think there is uh, value a little bit in her inside distance line. Um, oh, it's actually gotten... It's gotten a lot better, yeah. So it was minus 145. Now it's minus 175. So a little bit uh, less value there. Um, but I do think uh, she gets a finish. However, um, in terms of DraftKings scoring, um, I believe she's the most, is she the most expensive fighter on the card? Mason Chesson. Yeah, 9.4. So, I mean, she really has to get that early finish. Um, or if she gets it late in, she needs to have a bunch of takedowns and advances. So, I mean, I'll have exposure. She's a little expensive to be a core play. Um, uh, but I do think she gets the job done here, um, in some pretty spectacular fashion. Next fight up on the card, Daquan Townsend versus Devin Clark. Um, oops, let me X out of that. Yeah, so Devin Clark, um, Daquan Townsend, we just saw fight literally like three weeks ago, and now he's coming in as a replacement against Devin Clark. Devin Clark uh, was the heaviest favorite on the card. I think he still is, minus 310. The comeback on Townsend, 255. Um, we'll see if that's actually changed. Yeah, so it's actually gotten worse. 380 for Devin Clark to come back on Townsend, 315. Um, so it's actually changed in the past day or two. Uh, Clark doesn't have a good inside distance line though, and he is pretty expensive, 237 inside the distance, and it's actually trending the wrong way. Um, but, you know, I do think he wins here. Obviously, we've seen Daquan Townsend plenty of times now. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Devin Clark's a high school state wrestling champion and a junior college national wrestling champion. So, 
Um, we know what his game plan is. It's his game plan every fight. He's going to wrestle. He's going to hold you up against the cage. He's going to land takedowns, top control. That's how he wins fights. Um, he trains out of Jackson Wink, so he'll be the local local fighter in this one. And what's interesting is Townsend just fought Devon Lewis three weeks ago, who also trains out of Jackson Wink. So what was their game plan in that fight? Devon Lewis held him up against the cage. Uh, I think he landed a takedown or two. I can't remember. Either way, it was a very boring fight. I could see this one playing out very similarly, um, especially with the uh, Devin Clark's a much better wrestler than Bavon Lewis. So I expect Clark to land multiple takedowns to control every round and possibly even get a finish on the mat. Although it's probably not super likely, I do think it is in the range of outcomes. Um, but the only thing with Clark that does give me a little bit of a pause is he has had a little bit of a chin issue at times. Um, and that's likely really the only path for victory for Townsend is that he just lands something crazy early that stuns Clark. But you know, if, if you listen to anything of mine, you know that's not something that I generally bet on, especially with a guy like Townsend, who I just don't think is that good. Um, so the lean is Clark for sure. As for the betting line, it's just really wide for somebody that I think does have chin issues. Um, so I would actually rather, instead of betting him straight up, I would rather bet him by decision. Um, we'll see what the decision prop is for Devin Clark. Um, by submission, 573. Inside the distance, 237. Clark wins by decision is minus 114. So if he wins, it is likely that it's decision instead of just betting him at minus 380, which is kind of absurd. Just bet him to win by decision, um, and you'll pay a lot less uh, less juice on that one. But Devin Clark is the official pick, although I do think he's way overpriced on DraftKings. Next fight up on the card is going to be um, Casey Kenny versus Marab Devalish Billy. <laughs> I'm sure I butchered that, but uh, Devalish Billy, Valish Billy. I think the D is silent. Um, <laughs> Billy comes in at the minus 160 favorite here. The comeback on Kenny plus 140. Um, as you can see, it was actually really a lot heavier on Valish Billy. He was he touched minus 225 um, on Sunday. And then basically um, a big bet came in on Kenny or multiple bets. And basically it's hung around minus one, or 160, 165. It's been around there pretty much since Monday or Tuesday, whenever that bet came in. Um, but this one's definitely interesting. I feel like this is the fight that a lot of people, especially on MMA Twitter, is very torn on. And I could see why, because honestly, going back, and doing the tape study and research on both of these guys, I was kind of going back and forth a little bit at times. Um, it's definitely going to be a, a close fight, I think. You know, Volish Philly, 8.4K, Casey Kenny, 7.8K. So in terms of DraftKings, if you think it's going to be close, Kenny definitely um, is cheaper. So there's that. Um, and I can definitely see why people are split on it. Both guys have a similar style. Um, Volish Billy is basically a one dimensional wrestler and obviously wants to take the fight to the mat, but he really fails to do a lot of damage or threaten with submissions while he is in top control. And that's a really big problem to me against a fighter like Kenny. Kenny's on a six fight win streak, including wins over Ray Borg and Manny Bermudez, both of which are better than the competition that Volish Billy has faced outside of Ricky Simone. Um, even though I do think Ray Borg won that fight, um, but it is what it is. Kenny still looks good as a short notice replacement. Kenny's a black belt in judo, a brown belt in BJJ, which I think that's what I'm kind of uh, going with as the difference maker in this matchup is just the fact that Kenny is a really excellent scrambler. So in those scrambling exchanges, when it does go to the mat, I expect Ten Kenny to come out in favorable position from that. Um, and I do think he has the grappling advantage. And I think that judo can come into play as well. Um, so I, I do lean Kenny here. I can see this fight playing out just how the Ray Borg fight did with Volish Billy probably landing multiple takedowns, but really just failing to do any damage with that or threaten with submission. And I think Kenny will be able to reverse position 
uh, land the more damaging strikes and and possibly even threaten with his grappling. So I think Kenny by decision is the official pick. I do like the dog play at plus 160 or uh, what is it? Plus 140. I think it's plus 140 now. Yeah, plus 140. So I like that dog play as well. And you could even bet him by decision, which is a little bit better. Um, Kenny wins by decision plus 195. Um, and that's really, I think, the most likely outcome is, is Kenny by decision. Um, so I do like that dog play 7.8 K. I think he's one of the better underdog plays on the slate, uh, because I do think he, fa he scores fairly well with the, uh, grappling exchanges. All right. Next fight up on the card, Jim Miller, Scott Holtzman, Jim Miller, the plus 130 underdog here, Scott Holtzman, the small favorite at minus 150. This fight as a whole is minus 135, not to go to decision. I think that's actually gotten better. Yeah, so open at minus 130, touch minus 150. Now it's back up to minus 135, not to go to decision. And I think a big reason why is because we've seen Jim Miller's, like, what is it, his last five fights, something like that. Yeah, last five fights have all ended in the first round. And three of those were submission victories. So including that last fight against Clay Guida in the home state of New Jersey, it was kind of like his his big, you know, home fight. And, and he... The thing that's concerning, though, is is he did get stung by Clay Guida in that fight. And people don't talk about it because he rebounded nicely. He actually got uh, Guida back with a big, a big punch that stunned him. And then he hopped on a guillotine and submitted him. So um, the, the thing about Jim Miller, he's, he's a black belt, uh, great, great jiu-jitsu, former Division I wrestler. Um, he, he, he's definitely a good veteran test. You know, and and Scott Holtzman here is also a black belt. You know, probably not, a, definitely not as experienced as Jim Miller, but nine of his 16 professional fights have ended in decision. So he's basically the decision master here, whereas Miller lately has been like all first round or bust. Uh, but I do think Holtzman has the clear advantage in the striking department. And I believe that's why the betting markets have him as the favorite. Um, but I do think in terms of wrestling and grappling, I think I would lean Jim Miller, even though I think it's pretty close um, in, the, in those two departments. I wish I had more of a stronger lean in this one. But honestly, like the more I dug into this matchup, it, it really just seems like a very close fight. Like if you told me, you basically tell me the, like the outcome of this fight and no no matter what, I wouldn't be surprised. If you say Jim Miller subbed him in the first round, if you say Holtzman won a 30-27 decision, like really nothing would surprise me. I think these guys are very evenly matched. Um, and I think, you know, it's it should be a fun fight to watch, I think, just with the, the testing each other's grappling skills if it goes there. Um, obviously, it's very exciting with two black belts. So, um, but I, th I think my, I do lean Holtzman, although, like I said, it's not a strong lean. I think if he can hold his own in the wrestling and grappling department, then I, sh I think he would have the advantage on the feet. And that's what I keep going back to is, is that he'll win a decision. Um, but again, it's not a strong lean. I'll have exposure to both sides on DraftKings. As I mentioned, this fight is supposed to end in a finish. So we'll see what happens. Um, but I think it'll be decent for drafting scoring and they're both priced in the mid range. So I, I do, I do like both sides of this fight. Um, and I actually think there's some value on the, the Jim Miller inside the distance line. Uh, because if he does win, then it's likely to come by a finish. And right now we're seeing Jim Miller inside the distance plus three of one. It's actually, it's actually trending the wrong way. Uh, but I, I think there's definitely some value there. Three to one for Jim Miller to get a finish. Um, so I like that. Um, although I do think my, uh, not very confident, but my lean is Holtzman. All right. Next fight up on the card. It's going to be John Dotson, Nathaniel Wood, Nathaniel Wood, minus 145 favorite to come back on Dotson plus 125. Looks like, yeah, this was minus 165 earlier today or minus 170 even. So ton of late week money here coming in on John Dotson. Um, not super shocking that people are backing the veteran and John Dotson here. Um, especially uh, I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, the fight with Eduardo for Nathaniel Wood, how he's very hittable. And I believe that was his UFC debut. 
Um, I could be wrong on that. I'm pretty sure that was his debut. He has gotten a little bit better with that, but he is still very hittable, and that is concerning with Nathaniel Wood, especially against a guy like John Dotson, who does own, you know, multiple, multiple knockouts. And he's never been finished in all 11 of his losses. They're all by decision. So, um, you know, it it is what it is. I think it's it's really a stylistic clash here. Nathaniel Wood has won all three of his fights in the UFC by submission. And two only two of his 19 professional fights have gone to decision. So it's kind of crazy. You know, you have one fighter that's never been finished that is going to decision a lot. And then you have another fighter who's basically finishing a bunch of people or being finished. So it's kind of tough to predict here. Um, John Dotson is, like I said, the more experienced fighter for sure. Um, really just a gatekeeper at this stage in his career. He is training out of Jackson Wink, so he he is the local guy here. He he's he is a fan favorite as well, I think. So I mean, he's definitely going to get the crowd pop. But I think this is a good test for for Wood to see where he's at. You know, Dodson's a crafty veteran, tough to put away. Um, I still lean Nathaniel Wood here. Uh, the money coming in on Dodson is, is a little concerning, but I think it's just a case of you know when when we have the up and coming fighters that are showing a little bit of promise. And then we have just kind of these aging veterans. Um, I almost always lean with the up and coming fighters. Majority, every fighter is different, right? But the majority of the time, um, that is the right play. So I'm going to go with that. Um, I do think, you know, his grappling is impressive if the fight go does go to the ground. Um, although I think, you know, Dodson's a decent wrestler as well. So I don't know if Wood will be able to take it to the ground. And if he doesn't, um, maybe, you know, he is still hittable on the feet. It's possible. Um, but I just think he's the more active fighter as well. So that, that's going to come into play as, as, as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's not one that I really like betting on, although I do think, um, there is some value in Woods inside distance line just because he is a finisher and we've seen that pretty much every step of the way with him. And his inside distance line is plus 467. So I think there's definitely value in that. I like that bet quite a bit. I'm going to bet that. I haven't bet it yet. Um, I'll probably bet that later tonight. I'll see if it actually gets a little bit worse because it was plus 430. Now it's plus 467. So I might wait a little bit, but um, definitely going to have some, some money on that because in Nathaniel Woods wins, he is getting finishes. And I know John Dodson's uh, never been finished, but you know, Nobody thought John Jones would ever lose, and like it or not, but he, he probably lost on Saturday, even though the judges didn't think so. Um, so stuff like that, I mean, it's a high-variant sport in MMA, especially with guys getting older. Um, they are not invincible. So I do like that bet at almost 5-1 to one for Nathaniel Wood to get a finish, um, but, I, but the pick is, is Wood by decision here. Next fight up on the card is going to be Tim Means, Daniel Rodriguez. Tim Means, minus 280 favorite. The comeback on Daniel Rodriguez, plus 240. Means is definitely the uh, definitely not just the betting favorite, but the favorite in this one. People love Tim Means. If you don't know his story, he was basically like um, a drug addict and almost overdosed and died and then basically turned his life around with mixed martial arts. Um, great story, um, great fighter. He's always putting on shows. Fight doesn't go to decision minus 225. So Vegas is thinking there's going to be a finish here. Um, I, I tend to think so as well. Means inside distance lines minus 116. So that's obviously really strong. Um, in terms of DraftKings, he's right around 9K, I want to say. Means Rodriguez. Yeah, 9,100. Um, Daniel Rodriguez only 7.1. Um, so that's definitely um, one where I'm probably going to have exposure to both guys. Although, you know, the inside distance line is hard to ignore for means. He's the local New Mexican fighter, obviously. Daniel Rodriguez making his UFC debut. He fought on Dana White Contender Series this past summer, but he did not get a finish. So he didn't get a contract. But now he's getting his opportunity here against Tim Means. Uh, Rodriguez is a southpaw. He's pretty tough. He's got decent boxing skills, good wrestling skills. Um, but aside from that uh, contender series fight, 
His last five fights have ended inside the distance. So, and means it's a finisher. We know that he's lost uh, three fights that ended in, in the first round. So it's no surprise that this fight as a whole um, is it minus 255 not to go decision. So I expect this to be a very high paced fight where someone is going to probably take a canvas snap when it's all said and done. And I think means is just the more talented fighter overall. But like I said, I have some interest in Daniel Rodriguez here. I was impressed by him in the contender series fight. And I think he has enough dog in him to make this one a scrap. And, you know, I could see a world where Means doesn't get that early finish. Rodriguez has the better gas tank late. He's he's getting takedowns. He's tiring him out over the course of the rounds. And even, you know, landing some decent strikes as well because he, he is a decent boxer. So um, I do lean Means because I just think he's the better fighter. I don't like the betting lines, but I'll have exposure to both on DraftKings and I'll be overweight to this fight as a whole. And that wraps up the prelims. Um, now we can move on to the main card, uh, which kicks off with Lando Veneta versus Yancey Medeiros. Uh, both of these guys at 8.1K. Um, this one is basically a pick em fight. Uh, Veneta, minus 120, slight favorite, plus 100 on Yancey Medeiros. Fight as a whole, not to go to decision, is minus 110. Um, so it looks like this could be either way here. Um, Medeiros inside the distance line is plus 300. Veneta plus 246. Um, but that's actually trending the wrong way. It opened at plus 195. That's interesting. Um, this one is another one I've seen a lot of people be really confident on both sides of it. Um, I wouldn't say I'm really confident, but I definitely have a lean on this one. And it's, it's Veneta for me. You know, v Lando Veneta... Um, if you don't know about his career, basically he makes his UFC debut against Tony Ferguson. He looks awesome, um, even threatens Tony Ferguson, um, but he gets subbed in the second round. But it, it was a good showing, especially um, as a UFC debut against one of the best fighters ever. Um, so it's Tony Ferguson. It's not that big of a deal. He bounces back with a spinning wheel kick knockout against John McDessie and basically looks to have a really bright future ahead. And that was like the absolute like high point of his career because since then he only has one win over his last six fights. So that's not the trajectory we thought he was going to be on. Um, but he does train out of Jackson wing. So he'll be the local guy. I think that's why he's a small favorite here along with his durability because he's never been knocked out before. Um, he's also uh, experienced Brown belt in BJJ. I think that's probably his biggest advantage here. Uh, against Yancey Medeiros. Medeiros is coming off two straight knockout losses, so his durability is definitely in question. Um, and like I said, this fight, you know, Vegas thinks we could probably get a finish here. Um, but aside from the chin issues for Medeiros, he'll be at a grappling disadvantage, um, which, I, you know, I think that could play a, a pretty decent factor here. Uh, but he does have knockout power. He has eight knockouts um, to his record. So, you know, outside of like Madero's landing something heavy that knocks out Veneta, who's never been knocked out before, I don't think he wins this fight over the course of three rounds. And that's why I lean, um, I do lean Veneta here. I think Veneta could even get a submission here, but I'll have both sides of this fight on DraftKings just because I think this fight will score pretty decent. Um, this is one of the situations I've talked about before where I'm like probably like 80 to 85 percent sure that Maderos will lose. But in that like 10 to 15 percent of the time where he doesn't lose, he he wins by knockout. So that's the reason why I do have a little bit of an interest on Maderos, even though I think he loses this fight. So I'll have exposure to both. I definitely, definitely think uh, Veneta will win, though. Um, but overall, I think that fight should score pretty well. A great, great fight to kick off the main card, I think. It should be exciting. Next fight up on the card, we have Ray Borg, Rogerio Bontarin. We talked about Bontarin a little bit before um, when we were talking about the Paeva fight. Uh, Ray Borg, minus 150 favorite. The comeback on Bontarin, plus 130. 
Uh, I'm on Ray Borg here. Um, I like Ray Borg. I like his story. Uh, but I just like him as a fighter as well. Um, looking at the inside distance line, not great. Um, this fight to go to decision is minus 300. Um, so Vegas is telling us we probably see a decision here. I, I would tend to agree. Um, Ray Borg's the, another local Jackson Wink guy got back in the win column last time out against Gabriel Silva. That fight was a bantam weight. Now he's dropping back down to his normal cla weight class and fly weight. Um, he, you know, Ray Borg, we know what we're going to see. He's an excellent wrestler. He's landed 13 takedowns over his last two fights. And remember, those both of those fights were at bantam weight. So um, now landing that many takedowns at bantam weight, he should have no problem with a flyweight here. Um, going back to his original division, like I said. Um, but the problem is, you know, all he does is wrestle, wrestle and grapple. And that's fine. It scores well in draftings when he gets the advances. But in terms of striking, he doesn't throw volume on the feet. That's why the judges went with Casey Kenny in Kenny's debut, um, even though I think Borg won two of those rounds. But um, that is concerning for me because if he for, fails to get his wrestling going or grappling going, then he, he definitely scores low and busts his price. Um, his opponent, Bonturin, also a wrestling-based fighter. He's a black belt in BJJ, so it's going to be tough to grapple against him. Um, he's coming off the doctor stoppage victory against Paeva, where he hurt him with that big knee I talked about. But but in the beginning of that fight, Paeva was piecing him up on the feet. And that's not something I think Ray Borg will do, because like I said, he doesn't throw enough volume. Um, so I think this one's definitely going to be, you know, we're going to find out who the better wrestler is here. And I think basically Bonturin has the advantage on the feet just by his activity alone. But I do think Borg is the stronger wrestler. And I, I, I think, you know, it's possible that um, we could see, you know, some grappling exchanges where one fighter might might threaten here. You know, I mentioned Bonturin's a black belt. Ray Borg might, might have to be a little careful playing in his guard, but I don't think he's super dangerous off his back or anything like that. Um so I think if Borg's able to land takedowns and avoid getting subbed, then I think he gets the nod here as the decision. Like I said, he's the hometown fighter. Um, so I like Borg here. That's the official pick is Borg by decision. Um, I'll have probably a sprinkle of Bonter in just in the event that he is the better wrestler, although I don't think he is. Um, if I were playing 10 lineups, I'd probably go 7 Borg, 3 Bonter in. Um, if, if I was playing them in every lineup, if I wasn't, maybe I would go like six board, two Bonterin, two lineups with nobody, um, or something like that. But I did hear Bonterin on Twitter. Somebody posted it has been like fasting since Monday to make weight for this fight. And I know obviously fighter fighters fast to make weight, but that seems a little excessive. Um, that would concern me if you're backing Bonterin. Um, so I mean, obviously that's narrative based, but I mean, if he's if he's struggling that much to make weight, then it's not a good weight cut, and he's probably not drinking water either. So I don't know. It just seems like that. That's I, I know fighters do that from time to time, but it's usually just like two days, maybe three days. He's literally doing it for like four full days. Um, that's a little scary. Um, so if anything, it's just like me, like. Like, it makes me feel more confident in Ray Borg. Next fight up on the card, Brock Weaver versus um, Kazula Vargas. Brock Weaver, minus 265 favorite. Kazula Vargas, uh, plus 225 underdog. Fight doesn't go to decision, plus 145. Um, Brock Weaver, yeah, let's talk about him. Um, everybody's favorite up, up and coming prospect, right? Uh, no, uh, Brock Weaver, if you, if you didn't watch Dana White contender series, um, you know, he fought this past summer, earned the contract with a decision victory, which was impressive because anyone that watches Dana White contender series knows that basically if majority of the time, if you don't get a decision or if you, if you don't get a finish, then you're not getting a contract. And the reason why Brock Weaver got a contract is because of his personality. And whether people like that or not, that's fact. Like Dana White loves this dude. They they want this dude to be, um, you know, 
they they want to get behind this guy. And I think they're they're setting him up pretty well here in a favorable matchup. Um, Brock Weaver basically, um, I, you know, he's not that good. I don't think he's that good, but his personality, it's like the UFC wants people to, to think he's very good because he has such a great personality and character. Um, he's very entertaining. So he comes out in a Dana White contender series fight. He's, he's got, you know, the Indian, I think he's like, a is it Choctaw Indian or something like that in, uh, um, Alabama, some I Indian tribe in Alabama. Uh, I apologize for not knowing the exact um, tribe, but he's got a great story. He comes out with the Indian war paint, all that stuff, and then he starts pacing in the cage. He's like, somebody's got to go to sleep. Somebody's got to go to sleep. And uh, and then he, nobody went to sleep. He got a decision victory. Um, so that was, that was funny. But he's definitely a character. Um, if you've seen any of the pre-fight interviews on him, um, he's definitely uh, fun to watch, I think. He was originally supposed to make his UFC debut a couple months back, but was forced to pull out of the fight due to his testosterone levels being too high. They actually thought he was on steroids. Uh, turns out he just has really strong genetics. So um, he's been cleared to fight, obviously, and now the UFC couldn't wait to get him back um, booked for a fight. And here he is now on a main card, on a pretty decent card. So, um, you know, this guy Vargas, I really don't know much about him. I don't think he's that good. Both guys are brown belts in BJJ. Um, he, Vargas has a, a little guillotine. But on the feet, I favor Brock Weaver. I favor Brock Weaver in the wrestling department. And I think the grappling's pretty even um, as both guys are brown belts. So, I like Weaver striking, and I think his durability comes into factor here, as well as, abil as his ability to land takedowns. So Weaver, by decision, is the official pick. I do think the betting line is way, way too wide. Um, that's not a secret. I think everybody feels the same way. Just because we, we're seeing a low-level um, fight, basically, on both sides. So in a low-level fight, you never want to see close to a 3-1 to one favorite. I'm not going to lay the juice there. Um, although I do think he wins, um, maybe you can target him on DraftKings and hope he does get a finish. You know, he came out, um, in an interview and was saying like, yo, I know I don't have a ton of finishes. He's like, but get one thing clear is I'm always looking to finish. Um, and, and he definitely is, you know, that checks out. If you go back and watch the tape on him, he is always looking for a finish. He just doesn't always get it. Um, but at 9.2 K, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to play him on DraftKings. You, you can play him on DraftKings and hope for the finish, but like I said, that price tag, he really has to get a finish, and there's just better plays. You know, Tim Means has a strong inside distance line. He's $100 cheaper. Michelle Pereira, who's the next fight I think we're going to talk about at only 8.5K, he has a great inside distance line. Um, so overall, I'm going to be underweight to this fight as a whole, uh, but definitely going to enjoy it from a fan perspective because I do like the personality of Brock Weaver. Next fight is actually the uh, Romero Borella fight versus Monta Montana De La Rosa. Um, De La Rosa minus 170, the comeback on Borella plus 150. Fight as a whole to go to decision is minus 245. Uh, Rosa's inside distance line was actually not that bad. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's trending in the right way. It's down to 260. Um, that's not bad for a fight that we're expecting to go to decision. Um, but in terms of DraftKings, it is kind of bad. So that's what sucks. Um, if you are looking to target this fight, I'm not really going to, so we, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Um, she's 8.7 K Barella, 7.5 K. I was on Barella against Lauren Murphy. She got knocked out. It was really disappointing. She was a pretty decent favorite in that one as well. Basically ever since then, um, not just the fact that she burned me, but how she burned me. I'm, I'm not super impressed with her. I think De La Rosa is the better all-around fighter. Um, pretty much everywhere this fight goes. You know, De La Rosa is coming off the loss against Andrea Lee, but prior to that was on a four-fight win streak. She's a purple belt in BJJ. Barella is only a blue belt, I believe, so she should have a strong um, advantage in the grappling department and the striking department. Um the only place I think Barella has the advantage, she's obviously a black belt in judo. So that could come into play. But even if she gets like a couple judo trips or judo throws, I think De La Rosa's grappling um, is definitely 
uh, the better of the two. And I think she wins a stand-up at battle as well. So I I think she could threaten with a submission. I don't know if she gets it. Like I said, the inside distance line is interesting. Um, but at 8.7K, I don't have a ton of interest on this fight just because I think it's kind of one of those high floor, low ceiling fight on both ends, um, on both fighters there. So De La Rosa by decision is the official pick. But overall, in terms of draftings, I'm not that interested. So we can move on. Next fight up on the card is a co-main event. Diego Sanchez versus uh, Michelle Pereira. So this is what I'm going to call um, the people's main event. Uh, usually we have one of these on every card. This would definitely be that one for this card. Pereira is a uh, minus 160 favorite to come back on Diego Sanchez, plus 140. Fight as a whole, minus 205 not to go to decision. Um, so basically, for those that don't know, Pereira is the guy who does a lot of crazy stuff um, couple, during his walkout, in the cage, literally, like we saw the fight against Leon Edwards, um, doing like spinning crazy stuff, running, sprinting, trying to kick off the cage, doing backflips in the middle of a fight against Tristan Connolly. He ended up losing that fight. Um, got super gassed out, uh, was breakdancing on his way into the octagon, doing flips during the fight, like flips into guard, crazy stuff like that. Like he wants to put on a show. Um, very, very fun to watch. Um, and then on the other side, we have Diego Sanchez, you know, a crafty veteran, uh, black belt in uh, BJJ. He's been, you know, he was the original Ultimate Fighter winner. Um, you know, it's it's just... It's, it's going to be a fun one. I mentioned Pereira, best inside distance line on the slate. And at just 8.5K on DraftKings, I think. Yeah, 8.5K. I can't ignore that. You know, that that alone is going to make me have a lot of him. Just because that's really, really hard to ignore. Um, minus 126 is his in inside distance line. Um, so at 8.5K, that's that's very, very strong. He's a strong tournament play. Um, I do think Diego Sanchez is live, though, just in the event that, like, we saw it with Tristan Connolly. You know, if Pereira gasses out, um, then, you know, Sanchez could threaten. He is a black belt. Um, if it goes to the mat and Pereira is gassed, then Sanchez is live. That's pretty much the only way Sanchez is live. Aside from that, I think Pereira pretty much dominates. Sanchez is kind of punch drunk at this point. Uh, either that or he's just playing crazy. Maybe a little bit of both, uh, but I don't think it's going to take much to get him out of there. Um, and Pereira does hit very hard. So Pereira by knockout is the official pick. I'm going to have a ton of him on draftings. Hopefully he doesn't burn us like he did against Tristan Connolly. Last fight up on the main card is the main event, Corey Anderson versus Jan Blakovich. Corey Anderson, minus 210 favorite to come back on Blakovich, plus 175. Fight doesn't go to decision, it's minus 130. Um, I actually think there's value in fight goes to decision. Neither of these guys are finishers, I'd say. Um, inside distance line for Blakovich, plus 315. Um, inside distance line for Anderson is plus 185. So basically, um, this one, I think, is pretty much one of two ways. Either we see Corey Anderson wrestle, and I think he, we're going to see that regardless, but I think we see him have success with wrestling, holding him up against the cage, and dominating him basically over the course of five rounds with his wrestling and winning a decision. Or because Corey Anderson has been knocked out and he, some people would say he does have chin issues, uh, been knocked out against OSP, been knocked out against Jimmy Manoa, um, you know, but, you know, he's rebounded well, three straight decision victories, then the knockout win against Johnny Walker. Um, I was big on Johnny Walker in that one. But when we do see him fight to decision, he's doing enough in terms of takedowns um, and, and advancing to where he scores very well on DraftKings. So at 8.9K, if you think he can land takedowns and avoid getting knocked out, 
then I think he is a strong tournament target. And that's kind of my lean here. Um, just because I, you know, against guys that I, I don't think he's, he's shot by any means. So, and like I said, Blachowicz, not really a finisher. So I think Corey Anderson can avoid the knockout. I think he can wrestle, have some su- success there, land takedowns, advanced position, maybe even threaten with some grappling. Uh, but either way, I think he has a high floor. I do feel comfortable, um, uh, leaning him for sure. I'll, it's a main event. I'll have pieces of both, but definitely a stronger lean towards Corey Anderson. Um, I mentioned Blakovich, not a, not a, a strong finisher. Just fought five rounds with Jacare Souza. Only landed 71 significant strikes. Five-round decision, and he scores 66 points. That's just not going to do it for us, even at 7.3K. Um, and obviously, knocked out Luke Rock- Rockhold before that. Um, but you know, Luke Rockhold, that's a guy who I would say his chin is shot. So aside from that, you know, he's really doesn't finish fights. He's a decision machine. I know he has a couple subs, but not really a knockout guy. So, um, yeah, I'm not a ton of interest for me in Blakovich. I would lean Corey Anderson. I think he's a solid play on DraftKings as well. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I see that one playing out. Any questions, get them in the chat now. Um, I'll hang out here for, just a minute or two before we get out of here, but that's how I see the fight playing out. I, like I said, I think it's an underrated card just because, you know, a lot of people, um, they're not the biggest names, but I, I do think we have some exciting talent, um, some up and coming talent and definitely some entertainment. Even if you don't think these, uh, this card is very talented, you can't argue that it's going to be entertaining with guys like Diego Sanchez, Michelle Pereira, Brock Weaver, um, you know, there's just up and down Ray Borg, love his story. Tim means, you know, these, it, it's, it's really an underrated card. I'm super excited for it. It is, uh, one of the free cards. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing on my Saturday, Saturday, uh, for any updates, um, you know, the article to this video, basically, um, article is always similar, but it does go into a little bit more detail is going to be up on fightnumbers.com. That'll be up, uh, that'll be posted tonight. Um, this, video will be available in podcast forms on apple uh spotify and stitcher and on youtube as well on youtube.com if you look uh search for fight numbers it'll come right up fightnumbers.com is the website it will have ownership projections posted by tomorrow DraftKings player rankings and line movement updated on saturday um, again that is all free 100 percent free i ask of nothing from you guys uh, just please click the heart button on my channel um, and give me a follow. I definitely appreciate it. But good luck this this week, guys, and we will see you next week.